Welcome again to our panels, and this is our third panel of the day and final panel, as Alex said. Um, and again, welcome back if you've been with us uh, earlier today, and welcome in general if you're joining us for the first time. I will introduce myself again. I am Shasta Gon. I am the Environmental Director and the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Paula Band of Mission Indians in Poyongkawichom Territory, or Luisinho Territory. I'm sitting in my office on the Paula Reservation. And I'm very happy and excited that these wonderful panelists are here to talk with us about building resilient communities. And we've you know, been going over resilience from uh, the very beginning of our, our sessions today. And wrapping up with communities, I think, is the most important thing. We've done extremes and we've done ecosystems, but really those extremes and, and those ecosystems are all impacting human communities. So I'm going to have each of our panelists spend a little bit of time introducing themselves and uh, start with, uh, now I'm going to say her whole name because I know the whole name and we already talked about this, Nicolette Elvira Cooley. <laughs> oh, I just love it. Yat e adet nahi so kaigi she e Nikki Cooley or Nicolette Elvira Cooley dashajine. Can you ani nishna look at the nevashish chink as a slana e dashinadek? Tore head lini e dashiche. Shan't tore that dog fish dot is in deskis de e nasha. I put our eat dine a son in nishna. I just introduced introduced myself to you as a Navajo woman. I come from Shanto and Blue Gap, Arizona with Northern and Eastern Arizona. And I am of the Tarrant House clan born for the Reed people clan. Maternal grandparents are from the water that flows together. Paternal are from the uh, many goats clan. And this is how I always introduce myself to you and anybody else as a Navajo woman. Um, I am the co-manager for the tribes and climate change program and we are within the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals, and we're based out of Flagstaff, Arizona, um, under the Dok Oslid, which is one of our sacred mountains. And I'm um, really happy to be here today. So, yeah. Thank you, Nikki. And uh, I'm gonna move it over to Kristen Vandermolen. Thanks, Shasta, and thanks everyone. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in, in today's events. Um, so I am part of the research faculty at the Desert Research Institute, um, which is a research institute based in um, neighboring Nevada. So I work out of a Reno-based campus, but most of the work that I do takes place in California. Um, and so the work that I do is focused on the human dimensions of climate change. So understanding the impacts of climate change to communities and then working with groups of researchers, the communities themselves, uh, different groups of stakeholders and often government entities to think and, and work collaboratively to address those impacts. Um, some examples of the, the work that we have going currently or have been doing of late are um, helping small and medium sized businesses to adapt to wildfire impacts um, in Northern Central California, um, working to um, help communities in Southern California and Northwestern Mexico um, self-protect against extreme heat, and working with agricultural producers in, in Northern California, Southern Oregon, and soon in um, Southern California and San Diego County specifically, um, to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Um, and I will say that, that a lot of the work that we do takes place in locations that experience um, particularly extreme impacts from climate or locations that have been um, experiencing impacts on, on kind of a longer timeline or, or otherwise um, repeated um, impacts. And, and our reason for doing so is that they're often good places um, to generate uh, lessons learned from, from what people have been doing and what communities have been doing to adapt and to work toward becoming more resilient. Um, and then for us as, as researchers and um, groups working on those issues to think about their generalizability to other regions uh, that might be on trajectories to, um, you know, experiencing more, 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 um, more extreme impacts themselves or, or more frequent impacts themselves. Um, so that is, in summary, what we do. 
All right, thank you, Kristen. And now Durrett. You're muted. <laughs> Hi, I'm Durrett, Quintana English. I, I work for the California Department of Public Health in the Office of Health Equity. Um, I work on the BRACE project, which is the Building Resilience Against Climate Effects. Um, and in my work, I've worked with local health departments, tribes, and across agencies to infuse uh, climate change knowledge as well as um, issues of equity and inclusion and justice. And personally, I'm from California. I was born in Oakland, California. I've lived um, in the Sierras for around 30 years and recently returned to the Bay Area. So I could join this team um, six years ago to participate in working on climate change after experiencing extreme uh, weather, wildfires, and heat in the Sierra Nevadas over the last 30 years increasingly and in, with more frequency and intensity. And felt like I needed to um, put myself in a place where I could have a broader impact than my local community. My, my background um, in environmental health started with um, working with a small group of residents in Plumas County and we um, successfully petitioned the U.S. Forest Service to stop spraying 245T on the uh, Plumas National Forest and our research was so compelling that the U.S. Forest Service put a 10-year ban on spraying uh, herbicides across the whole nation rather than um, see us in court. So um, that's kind of how I came to environmental health work and I'm excited to be here today and I'd like to also acknowledge both the Ohlone people from where I am today and the Luceno and Kumaye people where San Diego region and all other tribes that are located in that area. Thank you, Durrett. And Will, um, glad you were able to, to join us after Connor stopped bending your ear. <laughs> so please introduce yourself. Yeah, me Omo Emman. My name is William Madrigal Jr. and um, I'm Kawia Nuseño, uh, which are a couple of the many tribes that are native to uh, Southern California region. I currently live in uh, San Diego County with uh, my wife's family on the Palma Indian Reservation, which is very close to Paula. And um, here in a couple capacities, I'm uh, a member of the Kuya Band of Indians, uh, professor of American Indian Studies at Cal State University San Marcos, uh, UC Riverside and Palomar College. And um, professionally, I've, I've trained as a cultural resource manager. Uh, I practice the archaeology and representation for tribes in the, the cultural resource process, process to protect sites and items and uh, human remains that were uh, in, 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 uh, uh, about to be in, in desecrated as a result of ongoing private and commercial development projects throughout Southern California. Um, and recently I'm uh, glad to be a part of CSA and the CSA team. Um, and uh, a new addition fairly recently came on board uh, about a month ago. And um, just, yeah, glad to be here. Glad to meet all of you. Um, and hoping that we'll have a very insightful and uh, very informative uh, discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Will. And I, I have no doubt with this tremendous panel that we're going to have a, a wonderful conversation. And since we're talking about community, I, I want to start it out um, with Nikki, actually, and, and probably come back to you as well, Will. 
But as you know, this, this climate change work that we do, it, it goes across the boundaries of communities. And for both of you working on the climate side of things, but also in doing work with tribal communities, where do you see that overlap for resilient communities? Uh, and so Nikki, for you as a Diné woman, uh, but also working with tribes all over the nation, where do you see hope for resilience in these communities? I think um, where I see hope in the communities that I work with um, and communicate with are in literally like in the communities that are on the res or, um, you know, not in these suburban areas, but we have a lot of youth, up and coming youth. And when I say youth as people younger than I am <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and also the elders too, would like, we're really coming together um, that are living on the reservation, some without running water or electricity because they choose to do so, but also they're trying to bring more renewable energy like solar and wind power, uh, power onto the reservation lands and whatnot. And um, it just gives me goosebumps right now to think about the people, the young people that are really doing what it takes and that's um doing it within the communities they're working with the elders they're caring for each other they are singing the songs they are praying but also they are going to their leadership and demanding um, that they address climate change whether it's through a resolution through a climate adaptation or mitigation resilience plan um, or just demanding that they recognize that the communities are hurting right now. And a lot of these folks are doing it without really good internet service. And so there's that thing. And I see that every day. And we, you know, here on the reservation in Indian country and tribal lands, word of mouth um, usually is the fastest way. And believe me, you know, Navajo Nation is uh, about 17 million acres. I can hear something that's going on on the other side of the reservation in in a day you know word travels fast whether it's through phone or um fax yes we still use fax in some areas um or by internet or by social media so that's where i really see that hope and i see kids as young as you know eight um you know like my daughter she's 10 and they're really talking about climate change in their course cur uh, curriculum and and whatnot so that's where i see that hope and they're crossing boundaries when I say boundaries, you know, there's reservation lands, there's county, then there's, um, you know, the state, and then, um, yeah, the federal. And we have to jump th through those loops every single day. And the people are uh, doing it, that I'm seeing them do it. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it over back to you. Yeah, those are great things to, to have hope in. I agree with you that, that the youth is so important and, but also the cross, crossing over those community boundaries. And so, Will, you're an educator, you are a scholar and you have the opportunity to talk about tribal community values and now you work with the, the Alliance. And so there's the climate change component of that. How do you see the tribal communities as, as having um, lessons to offer to people who are not tribal? Well, yeah, um, I think it's, it's all coming full circle for me. I think that um, I, I agree exactly with, uh, with Nicolette and that really our focus is in the, the youth leaders of tomorrow for our Indian communities and uh, resilience and hope. We're always, um, present in Native communities through the practice of our traditional ways, how we can care for the land, how we uh, treat each other, right? Uh, how we treat the plant world and the animal world, uh, how we use these ways to sustain us both physically, mentally, and spiritually. So um, I was fortunate to grow up on uh, the Kuya Indian Reservation that I'm from, and I was fortunate enough to be taught my ways and to be taught my language and how to communicate with uh, the environment and the rest of the world. So moving forward, um, I think that we need to continue that learning. We need to continue passing on uh, this knowledge through oral tradition. And uh, we now have modern ways to do that. So whenever we talk about, you know, the disparities created by climate change on the reservations, I think that 
we already know the solutions and answers to those because they're ancient and then then they're from the beginning of time really and uh we just need to come back to them we need to revitalize them reclaim those things and put them into practice uh by educating our our, our families and our youth so uh I, so i tried to strive to do both as uh, a member of my tribe and as 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 a uh, college professor uh, as a teacher you know to try to to reorient everyone and uh, also you know non-indians as well bring them into the conversation uh, that this knowledge exists and indian people are willing to share it with uh, the rest of the world through through various ways um, and so i'm hoping that um, through csa we'll continue to do these type of collaborative projects that are very meaningful and, and very educational for everybody who's involved. And they're starting to create more and more of an impact in both the native communities and other communities. So I'm very optimistic in the work that we're doing together and the bridges, the cultural boundaries that we're, we're overcoming, right? To work together, to see things from each other's perspective to bring the Western science together with the indigenous science, which is epistemic knowledge, the knowledge that comes from the beginning of, of time. So uh, I'm hoping that, uh, that, that we will continue that work together and that we will strengthen our, our collaborative efforts together. Good, thank you. And I, and I thank you both for that willingness to, to share because you know community I think in, in this fight, we can't be talking about it in terms of boundaries and, and who is uh, who does belong and, and who doesn't belong. But in, in terms of overall resilience, um, Kristen, I'll turn to you. And uh, I, I'm sorry that my geography is not that great. So I'm just sort of randomly thinking you and Durant, you're both in Northern California. So I'm going to assume there's a fire burning somewhere near you. Uh, at this moment, you said you're in the, the Tahoe region. So I don't know if it's close. But can you talk to us about what the climate effects are on the resilience of, of communities where you are? Sure. Um, I think, um, you know, the, the, the effects are, are many and I'll kind of maybe step back actually in talking about this question. You know, we're um, always looking at climate impacts and, and now we're looking at um, what a lot of people describe as the compounding effects of climate and um, COVID-19. Um, and it's, it's a good way to kind of characterize um, the experience of climate impacts right now, for example, by way of wildfire, where you have, um, you know, reductions in available personnel to be fighting wildfire, um, you have people being evacuated. Um, due to wildfire, um, but with, you know, the need to take precautions um, given the pandemic. Um, at the same time, you know, one of the things that we always come up, um, or one of the things that comes up in, in our work is, is that there are always multiple, multiple layers, multiple challenges, multiple issues um, coinciding with whatever the particular climate impact is, um, and whether that's to an agricultural business, um, you know, a, a restaurant, um, a farm worker community, um, what have you. And, and so um, some of the things that, that we're looking at currently are, um, you know, not only how wildfires are, um, again, this summer impacting businesses in that kind of North Central California area, um, but how, um, how, how those impacts are uh, interacting with those other layers of challenges that are always present, and then the additional layer um, and compounding effect of, of COVID-19. Yeah, many challenges that we're facing. And speaking of COVID-19, Durrett, you know, with the public health aspects of this, there are multiple community challenges as far as the health impacts of climate change in our communities. So can you address what you think some of the most significant impacts are and from the health perspective? Don't forget to unmute. <laughs> Hey, um, you know, there's so many intersecting um, threats and risks and hazards. And, and I think, you know, we're really looking to at the underlying um, 
and historical um, disproportion of impacts from poverty and unequal distribution of resources in our society um, and marginalizing of different populations in different ways so that um, they're much more um, vulnerable right now to the air pollution that's coming from this wildfire smoke to COVID-19 and other um, threats that we're dealing with. And, and I think if you overlay those um, on a map, you would find that they also are um, the same areas that have been affected by redlining and housing um, in the state. And so we really, in order to create more um, health, a, a healthier environment, we really have to unravel the um, the racism and the discrimination in the state that's embedded in our processes and systems and um, some of the historical um, legislation that's occurred in the state, both at the local and state level. So um, there's quite a overlap and overlaying of these um, historical injustices that need to be brought back into balance. And I think the natural world um, is similarly impacted, you know, in, in the same kind of ways that we've um, created an imbalance in our society that's hurting all of us now. Um, we've done the same with the natural world. Um, of course, we are a part of it, but I mean, it is sort of a sense of um, using it without discretion and, and not as partners and relations. And I think that's an area where uh, this state and is moving under Governor Newsom to try to correct some of those historical imbalances and relationships that are out of balance. And I don't want to um, underscore the dire situation I think our state is in right now regarding COVID-19 or our wildfire um, vulnerability. Up in Plumas County, there was over a 400 AQI air quality index the other day. And um, a lot of my close friends have been evacuated across the state in different communities. So um, what I do see though, and I want to say is a lot of people helping each other. And that goes back to um, our first responders are usually the people who live next door. And um, people always come forward and step up and reach out. And, and I think increasing our capacity to do that at the local level is a really huge part of resilience, um, as well as the bigger picture issues that we have to tackle and that are, um, you know, part of creating a, a, a more just California where hopefully we can tackle climate change and the impacts, but also not have certain communities that are bearing the brunt of these um, triple threats we're experiencing now. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with every, every word you said. And, uh, and I want to remind our listeners as well, our audience, that at any time, you can put questions in the question box. And I think one of them, there was a question and it was answered. And I, that was to Durette. So I think, did, Durette, did you answer that question? <laughs> yeah. You don't have, you don't have to did. answer in real time. But I thought, oh, that question disappeared. Somebody must have, must have answered it. So, uh, but you bring up a good point, which is that if we're going to build resilience, we need to understand what the barriers are to resilience and from like for the wildfires there's certainly some political aspects to that that i think are a barrier so for example uh, raking the forests is not going to stop wildfires <laughs> but and i don't want to take away from the theme of hope but again if we're going to have hope we need to identify the barriers that we need to overcome so i'm going to come back to will again and and ask what you see as some of the most significant barriers for uh, creating more resilience in communities. Um, okay, thanks Shasta. Um, I just wanna take this time to call attention to 
something that happened in uh, Southern California recently regarding um, the theft uh, of large quantities of white sage in a um, well-known uh, natural park uh, around the Ontario area. Um, there are many native practitioners in the area that that are also my elders that were contacted by the park um, to help uh, uh, address this situation and also to take possession of the hundreds of pounds of 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 uh, sage that was that was illegally pilf pilfered from the park area and uh, I think that this really um, brings to attention that the disconnect that that is out there in the public right um, the inability to recognize uh, plants as as living entities as as living beings as beings that we were told as native people to communicate with frequently and to man maintain a, a, a relationship with um, in order to uh, continue to have a, a mutual existence, right? Um, utilizing sage, uh, as we all know, for various uh, cleansing um, and medicinal purposes. And so I think that there needs to be um, a more dialogue and there needs to be a project that um, you know CSA and others can be collaborative on that will address this 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 crisis I really believe it's it's a crisis uh, an environmental crisis that uh, we need to continue to call attention to and we need to produce materials that will help uh, educate the public and bring them into this discussion and conversation about uh, about hope and resiliency and also about, you know, living practices. You know, I think that um, there still needs to be uh, the message that indigenous people continue to exist. They continue to utilize the land, do the spiritual practices with the plants, the animals, the water, uh, the mountains, the rocks, etc. And And so we're willing to showcase our cultural uh, values and we're willing to share our cultural traditions and life ways with the rest of the world. But are we going to be given that agency is the question. And most of the times uh, that's in doubt. So uh, I would like to see more projects, pilot projects, collaborative projects, um, lectures, webinars, you know, everything that where we can touch on these, 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 uh, these topics, right, that are affecting us right now. Um, and because uh, I think that it's critical, critical for us to move forward uh, together as, as one voice. So how do we get there? How do we achieve that, that level of understanding and respect, mutual respect for uh, bringing the two uh, perspectives together, the two schools of thought, Western science and indigenous science? Yeah, that's that's hugely important. And uh, Nikki, I can see that you're just nodding along, just you know, agreeing with everything Will is saying. So I want you to to chime in on that and, and tell us what you're thinking. Yeah, I really like what Will said. He summed it up really well. So I'm just going to add to it is that a lot of these barriers are you know political on a national global level, but also the regional and local level is is extremely tough to get through tribal leadership and you can just look to the Navajo people who have leadership that has gone up and down in regards to how they view um, I guess the indigenous indigenous uh, Navajo viewpoint of the earth you know um, I, I think there I think some of the barriers other than political are like the continuous development you know, we have this mindset of having more is better. And the Industrial Revolution brought that. And, and uh, we're, we, when I say we, I mean the five-fingered beings, the humans, um, are, are saying like more is better, bigger is better. And I have never seen more uh, four by four trucks um, in the city where I, I assume that they don't really need it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these gas guzzlers, um, just more out there um, because, you know, people are giving credit out like candy. Um, the, so that mentality of how more is better is really conflicting with 
the indigenous worldview of how we approach um, plants, animals, and whatnot. Um, you don't need to pick all the plants in the in the in the field because they're beautiful or they're medicinal or they're for food. You just pick one here and there, and you leave the rest to um, regenerate for next time or for someone else who may come along later that season. Um, you know, Western medicine is not king. You know, it's not the dominant, it shouldn't be the dominant way to take care of yourself. You know, we have that mentality. It's all these commercials, these social media, you know, a lot of people fall into that trap and even more so now with that, with that. But um, the last thing I want to end with is, um, you know, these academic institution. And I was, when I first met Will, um, I was so impressed that he was a professor um, and that he was getting his degree, you know, he was teaching, you know, for me to see indigenous um, people with PhDs, with lawyer, uh, to being lawyers, or even people that are non-indigenous that have worked with or for um, tribes for so long, you know, um, it's, it's just impressive to me. And I'm, I, we need more people like that. Um, academic institutions should insert climate change into their curriculum. Faculty and staff should be the elders from the community. Um, you know, here at Northern Arizona University, we have tribal elders on staff. They're like they're actually staff. They don't have, they don't necessarily need to have PhDs or, um, uh, you know, what is it, the Juris Doctorate, um, all that stuff. So that kind of stuff, if we're more inclusive, I feel like we can be more um, well-rounded to um, approach climate change. And I think that's what Climate Science Alliance is doing. I see Desert Research Institute doing that quite a bit. Dorette is always asking, um, you know, everybody to be involved. She involves everybody. So everybody on this panel, and I know I recognize some people in the participant box that are doing that. So we need to just get that out there and get everybody on our side. So with that, I'll throw it back to you. <laughs> well, and that's a great point. I think we have a community of practitioners together who are all working in this, this same area. But from the, the human standpoint, or as you say, you know, the, the, the five, five fingered beings, uh, we're, we're putting ourselves into situations that I think exacerbate the, the effects. So, so Kristen, I want to ask you about that. And this is actually a question from one of our previous panels, but you probably have some insight on this. You know, with more and more human beings like pressing themselves into these urban environments, you know, can you tell us a little bit about some of the, the best practices or what's the thinking about adapting to heat stress in these like crowded urban environments? Um, sure, that's a good question. Um, incidentally, the, the work that we're doing on um, heat impacts is actually primarily in, in rural areas. Um, oh. Yeah, and so, so focus sort of um, in the Imperial Valley region and the, yeah, and um, our, our reason for focusing on rural areas um, is in part because a lot of attention has been given to urban areas, um, particularly with um, all of the work that's been done on, on urban heat island effects. Um, and so we wanted to focus in on rural areas, particularly since those tend to be where um, a lot of our farms are and a lot of farm workers are working outside under really hot temperatures. Um, and where there are a lot of um, structural issues and inequalities that get in the way of people being able to take protective action um, to, to mitigate the negative um, health impacts of heat. Um, so, and, and it's kind of interesting, and this gets back into some of the um, comments of other panelists just now um, with respect to barriers, um, because um, in, in, you know, coming together as, as researchers to try to help communities, and in this case, farm worker communities, um, adapt to extreme heat or to be able to uh, effectively protect themselves against extreme heat, we run into those issues of inequality. Um, so, you know, we can do as much messaging as, as we want, and we can spend as much time as, as we want um, ensuring that the messaging is effective in the degree that it's comprehensible. Um, and we can work to, um, we can work on forecasting to try and forecast uh, extreme heat episodes and heat waves at longer lead times to inform people in advance. But if at the end of it, 
Um, people are facing economic disincentives to protect themselves against extreme heat or if they fear repercussions like job loss, um, if they you know, take, take um, protective measures, um, or even if they seek the help that they need when they are experiencing heat-related illness, then um, there's, there's, you know, those things constitute pretty significant barriers. And then um, for us as researchers, kind of force us to redirect and rethink efforts as to um, how we can work toward overcoming those uh, barriers and, um, and, and actually being effective in these more rural areas where um, there, there is a lot that gets in the way of people being able to protect themselves. Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, the, the discussion of barriers, again, is I think a really important one, but as equally important is the discussion of what do we actually do and, and where do we where do we go from here? So Duran, I'm going to give you a, a hypothetical. You know, since you work for the, the state of California, I'm going to say you've, you've just been elected governor and we now have Governor English of California. Um, tell us, Governor, how are you going to uh, support people and communities as they adapt to the effects of climate change? Unmute. You can tell I'm a technical genius, right? <laughs> well, <clears throat> that is a huge um, undertaking. And right now, you know, in terms of local communities, I, I think we would need a, both a top down and a bottom up grassroots and grass tops connecting together. Um, I think some of the work you've been doing with the tribal organizations and tribes across the country in terms of getting adaptation plans in place really sets the stage and, and Nikki also has been engaged in that work across the country um, to identify what are the things that are needed at the local level to what kind of resources, what kind of inclination do local communities have. And then I, I think the um, the state is very much interested in responding to those needs and providing resources within the, the scope of its capability, um, which right now, unfortunately, is stretched pretty thin because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic and the way it's so rapidly changed our economic outlook. Um, so I think there's so many um, policy levers and ways that different agencies can respond. And I know right now there is more and more emphasis on, on the agencies working more with regions and local um, jurisdictions to make those connections. And the same with research in the state and the country. I think more um, climatologists and other researchers involved in climate adaptation and mitigation are thinking more about how to put their work into practice and how to work with communities to make sure that their research is relevant to the needs of what communities need to um, drill down into more information about in order to um, put together effective strategies. And I, I feel like, um, you know, we're in a time where um, California's really had a lot of prosperity at different times, but it's, it's, um, it's always come at the expense of, of certain groups or even speaking of our farm workers, you know, um, Kristen just brought up, it's always at the expense, it seems like when we have a massive prosperity of some groups and places in the state. And so I, I feel like conservation and really um, thinking about what we really need to be happy and what prosperity really means is essential for us to do in order to move forward um, and, and really move away from those kind of constructs where the prosperity of some is reliant on the, you know, ingestments, 
un injustice, displacement, or um, other impositions on others. And I think it's a whole shift in the way we think about what success means and, you know, how we build our cities and how we retrofit our cities and communities in the future and just ba balancing those things out. I, as governor, English, I don't have um, all the answers, but I think it will take um, input from across the, the, the um, spectrum of our dynamic state, which is just so amazingly diverse in respect to our, our um, first um, people who and have inhabited this land longer than any other groups and have a lot to share from thousands and thousands of years of experience with the land and with living in harmony with the land. So I would leave it at that. Well, thank you, Governor. I will vote for you for re-election. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to add, and, and it hadn't come up, and I feel like it's really important to, to say you know, in the work we're doing, we're really trying to promote addressing the what we call the social determinants of health. And, and I thought today when I was thinking about that, maybe they're the social determinants of hope also. And oh, yeah. you know, that is that we, we have good housing, um, green communities and health access and things like that. I love that, the social determinants of hope. Uh, I think that's really important. And but you you mentioned the the tribal communities, you know, the first people of of California. So you know, Will as one of them. Uh, this this comes back to you. Uh, can you speak to how some of the say some of the um, engagement strategies or solutions in California are maybe not being are not working as well for tribes because of the the nation to nation or the government to government relationship. Do you think more can be done to bring California's first people into the conversation about climate resilience? Yeah, I mean, real quick, there's, there's a lot of things that can be done and a lot of different approaches, I think. Um, uh, but I'll just mention kind of the most basic one to me is just, um, you know, realizing where you're at, no matter where you live, but realizing that there are Native people there. Um, and then reaching out, making a full-fledged effort to reach out to those Native people that can tell you more about the history of the land, um, as well as, you know, uh, initiating uh, a relationship hopefully a long-term relationship that will um, become a, a collaborative relationship. Um, so what, what, whether you're, you work for the state, state agency, federal agency, um, county agency, or city agency that um, needs to address immediate disparities caused by climate, climate shift, um, you know, uh, a lot of times, you know, it's, it, it it behooves you to do the simplest thing and in thinking about approaching tribes is just giving them a phone call, you know? Um, a lot of uh, tribes have their own website with their own contact information. And it's as simple as just, you know, Googling, you know, and finding those, those resources. So um, I like to see a lot of, you know, just uh, initial consultation or whatever you want to call it, you know, just reaching out to the local people, to the local indigenous people of whatever area that you serve. And I think that this will um, make a huge impact on how uh, the, the entire, you know, um, thinking on climate change and climate strategies, um, you know, how they, it will shape the future of strategies in the future. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think that that applies uh, not just in California, but in other states as well. So, you know, Nikki, of course, with the Navajo Nation, you are in Arizona, you're in New Mexico, you're in Utah, you're in Colorado. What do you think those, those jurisdictions and even the federal government, what would you like to see them bring to the Navajo Nation to help with climate resilience? 
Uh, probably, um, if I were dreaming, I would say probably um, more um, collaboration, more resources. And, you know, funding is always something that we all can use. Um, but yeah, some of that funding needs to be funneled into small community projects, um, like my brother, Roberto Lewis, um, and uh, my brother on the Hopi, I don't know how to say his last name, but he's a Dr. Michael K. And that, but they're doing these small uh, farm restoration projects using like indigenous methods that were passed down for, uh, since time immemorial. And yet they pay for their own, or you know, you get somebody like the Christensen Fund to pay for some of their, the work. Because, you know, that's hard work. It takes a lot of um, manpower. So they're, that's how they're engaging youth, engaging youth. Um, so maybe like somebody like the National Conservation Resource, um, people could help funnel that money, help with funneling some of that money to pay Hopi and Navajo farmers uh, to do what they've been doing, but also to spread the message about, you know, you don't need these big $50,000 machines to do farming. I would really like to see that. These four corner states have so many resources, including national parks, um, what do you call those, uh, national monuments. These areas have a lot of resources that they get, but they're all siloed. They just keep to themselves. And people think just because uh, um, tribal nations are sovereign that we, we solve our own problems, but we have to jump through so many hoops that um, certain organizations, federal agency organizations and communities don't have to jump through, you know, and that's what I mean by collaboration is getting down to that level in the community where they could be, you know, the farm bill is helping a little bit, but it's not helping my mom and dad who have to haul water almost every, every other day, you know. Um, and it's, and th this is one of the hottest summers I've ever experienced on the reservation. I didn't think I could make it, uh, and hot for us that over there is like 97. Um, that's, that's way too hot. And I didn't experience that heat when I was young. Mm -hmm. I'm still young, but when I was very <laughs> young, girl, yeah, the, the girl <laughs> part of that is very important. <laughs> Oh, you're absolutely right about the, the, the heat. I mean, we, we just uh, recorded the highest temperature in recorded uh, meteorological history in Death Valley, you know, highest in the United States at 130 degrees last week, uh, which is uh, unsurvivable by, by humans. But, um, you know, that's, we have a lot of questions coming in from our, from our audience. So I want to, I want to bring up one, since we're talking about crossing boundaries in terms of collaboration. So the question is that what kind of mutual aid have you seen emerge during the pandemic that could be tailored to the climate change space? And you know, I'll let any of you volunteer to answer that, but I'm, I'm kind of looking over at the, the Durant and Kristen side of the, the screen right now. <laughs> And neither one of you wants to, to take that one on. Duran, have you seen any mutual aid agreements that you think could translate to climate change? I, I don't know of any explicit agreements, um, but I do know that there has been a lot of um, neighborhood level mutual aid and people pulling together um, to support folks who are laid off specifically during COVID-19 and um, ensuring that people have adequate food. And I think one of the things that's really been phenomenal is that, and, and it hasn't been complete um, coverage, but that out of COVID-19, we've seen a lot of people who are formerly um, not living in housing be moved into housing and um, that is a social determinant of hope and health. And I think that um, these are some of the same issues we need to tackle to have climate resilience that we've been pushed um, kind of at an accelerated speed to tackle because of COVID-19. And um, I, I can't say at this very moment, um, 
off the top of my head the mutual aid, um, but I, I know there are many and there's a lot of conversations going on around the state about them. Um, one, one of the organizations I be, became aware of more recently too is a um, coalition of caregivers that were in New York City, um, where as you know they were really had a, a big outbreak and, and and I think they're a big part of also um, protecting and keeping communities resilient. There's so those people who are taking care of children, our nurses, our doctors, our people taking care of our elders and people with disabilities who need that kind of support and making sure they're part of the um, story. And they refer to themselves as the caring economy. And I, I really like that. And um, I think it speaks to mutual aid also. Um, a lot of the caregivers in our society are unpaid and at the personal sacrifice to themselves provide that care. I love that as well, the, the, the caring economy. And I think that needs to be a part of our definition of community, your community because you care. And Kristen, in your work with the effects of heat. Have you seen anything in, in people helping each other out in these extreme heat events that could translate to other climate impacts? Um, yeah, so um, in the work that we're doing on, on heat um, and health impacts in rural areas, we often partner with um, independent groups that work with farm worker populations so nonprofit organizations um, that often have really deep roots in the community and um, advocate for farm worker communities um, across issues. And um, we, the, the work that we've been doing on heat health has been disrupted um, because of the pandemic and it kind of became disrupted right at the point where we were starting to work um, with those types of organizations. Um, on the issue of heat and health, but there are plenty of examples um, in, in those organizations and others um, where they've been advocating um, for the health and well-being of local communities related to other climate related issues. Um, so certainly a lot of um, examples out there. Good, yeah, I'm glad. It's nice to take what we've already done and adapt it to new circumstances. And uh, I, I want to acknowledge that I have been uh, corrected by Sir Alex Tardy of the National Weather Service uh, on the Death Valley temperature. He says, highest at Death Valley since 1913, the 134 degree record apparently still still stands. So, so thank you, Sir Tardy. <laughs> uh, we just have a few minutes left. I want to remind our attendees that if your question wasn't answered, you can add it to the Padlet app that our panelists can look at later and hopefully get an opportunity to answer you. And I want to wrap this up as I did with the other three or the other two panels on asking each of our panelists where they find hope. So, uh, Will, I know you talked about this a little bit already, but I'd like to hear from you uh, briefly. Where do you find hope for community resilience against climate change? Yeah, I really enjoyed everything that was shared today by you all. Um, you know, you all are experts that we look up to and um, that, we look, that we look to you for hope, just like the younger generation, you know, is looking to us. And the next seven generations to come are looking to us uh, as well. And so uh, I think, you know, I can say that hope is uh, alive and well because um, we are revitalizing our traditional ways of tending the, the wild, tending the land and tending the water and all those resources that were entrusted to the first peoples. And what it comes down to in reality is that yeah we need a lot we need to bolster more support we need more funding from federal state local agencies right um to to strategize and then put into practice some pilot projects that um you know ha have to do with 
everything from you know traditional burning to you know some of these um, ways that we're trying to bring back uh, climate resilience, right? Um, and and we can uh, the best way is through education. The best way that I know as an educator, right, is to reach out um, through uh, these entities that are. Be, you know, coming up, you know, like Climate Science Alliance, um, tribal entities as well. They're, you know, each tribe is its own government. Each tribe, you know, has its own area that it's responsible for being stewardship to. Um, so I think that hope is all around us. Hope is, it's, it's tangible and it's visualized through the efforts that are happening today, the efforts, uh, that um, we're all as citizens of the world are, are contributing to, right? And, and that we are calling to attention these disparities, we're calling to attention these criminal acts of, of theft and, and of, of our natural resources, right? And, the, and also we're calling to, to, to light the, the detrimental effects of ongoing commercial and private development. So I think that, um, you know, uh, the more that we cultivate the hope that we're experiencing and seeing today through, through action, through art, through prayer, through uh, all, all these different ways of expressing it, you know, um, it, it, it's beautiful to see, but it's getting us to the point to where we need to be uh, in order that we can create a peaceful and prosperous futurity, right? Um, so I think that hope is all around us and we see it every day, but we need to, to recognize and cultivate it more and recognizing it in, in, in uh, all, all types of ways. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Will. It's great to, I love the idea of being surrounded by hope all the time. Um, Durrett, tell us about hope for you. I'm really hopeful and, and have been on, you know, different Zoom calls around the state in the last couple months and the people are really um, making me feel hopeful and that I'm just seeing so many um, younger people coming into the work of climate change and health and equity and um, bringing their enthusiasm and their hopefulness that sometimes I've, you know, lose touch with um, when I hear the projections for climate in the future and, and what we're experiencing now. But um, yeah, I'm just like, really feel like the people are my hope and um, the resilience and the capability of the planet to renew itself and regenerate with with uh, good care and reciprocity in our relationship. Thank you, Dorette. Kristen, where do you find climate hope? Um, sure, so I find um, climate hope often um, when interacting um, with the folks that we work with through our research. So with, with business owners or, or farmers, um, and learning about all of the innovative ways that they have already been addressing climate impacts. Um, and, you know, as researchers in working with these individuals and communities, when we um, kind of arrive into in these collaborations, we often have a lot of catching up to do um, because so many people um, have already been, been adapting and, and innovating and experimenting along the way. And it really becomes our role as researchers to um, figure out how we can support um, practices and, and initiatives that have already um, gotten a start. And so um, I continually find hope in, um, in interacting with, with individuals and communities that um, are already addressing these issues, though um, their stories are not necessarily ones that, that we hear frequently, or maybe what they're doing is taking place on a small scale and so can easily go unnoticed. Um, but I think that there's a lot of hope there. Thank you, Kristen, and saving my dear friend and sister Nikki for last. Um, and I want to say that all of you give me hope. And uh, Nikki, I want to let you have the last word on hope. 
That is so sweet. Thank you so much. I am, it's an honor to be on this panel with Will, Kristen, and Dorette, and with the amazing, great Shasta uh, <laughs> herding us around with questions. But I want to end with a couple of things, and that will show you what gives me hope. My parents still live on the reservation, and I hope to move back there someday. I live in Flagstaff right now. And uh, my mom still raises sheep. And I've been trying to get her to move to Flagstaff because, I don't know, I think she deserves a break. She works too damn hard. And, uh, but she won't. She's like, I won't be away from my sheep. I can't be away from here. In the Navajo way, when your umbilical cord dries up when you're born, after you're born, we bury it in a certain place. And hers is buried, um, uh, you know, far away from where we live now, but it's buried in the earth. And she says that that gives me uh, a connection to this place. And she still, you know, she had my kids grinding corn the, the traditional way. And she was teaching them about the puberty ceremonies, talking to them. And they, sure, they were sure eating it up. They loved it. They love to herd sheep. They love to butcher. They love to raise corn. corn and uh, take care of it, you know? So I, that gives me hope because she's keeping that alive. And the other thing too, and how, and that it translates the story about my son, he looked at a juniper tree and he said, Shema, mom, ha, who planted that tree? And it really, and I was like, mother, mother earth did, the holy people did. And he goes, no one put a seed in there? And, uh, oh, and uh, you know, he asked questions like that. And uh, now he's like, all right, Mother Earth, planet that, planet this, Father Sky is helping the birds fly. And, uh, you know, we have to listen to everybody, you know, that have these type of questions and these comments. Um, it's just not the youth. It could be somebody uh, in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they could just be having that woke moment um, about how to make a difference. And someone, my, one of my mentors in high school said, you speak to a thousand people and, and only one, and if only one person listens and then you have made a difference because that person could make those other thousand, 999 people listen in the future. And it always stuck with me. And that, that gives me hope. It really does. And or, organizations like Climate Science Alliance and um, and, and other organizations like ITEP um, really give me hope because we find laughter amongst all the, the crazy stuff that's going on. So that the long story short, um, I, that's what gives me hope is people, families and whatnot. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki and Will, Durrett and Kristen. And thank you to our attendees for being with us throughout these three panels today. Uh, you can go back to the uh, website for the summit and there's all sorts of recordings and, and chats and things still to do. Uh, but this wraps up our live sessions. And again, I want to give virtual high fives and, and hugs to, to everyone. And thank you so much for being here. Thank That's you, Shasta.